Welcome back for another week of Growing With My Fellow Growers. I'm your host, Jack Greenstock, joined as always by an amazing panel. I'm going to kick it over first to Spartan Grown. Welcome back. Thanks, Jack. I'm um, Spartan Grown. You can find me on Instagram. Uh, all one word, Spartan Grown. No spaces. Don't fall for the pretenders. <laughs> um, I have no other social media, just Instagram. And uh, if you don't have an Instagram, you can shoot me an email at spartangrown at gmail.com and get a hold of me there. And I can help you with your organic or synthetic gardening needs. Glad to have you back. Next up, Aaron, the grower. I do not have my phone set up on a very like stable place. So you're just going to keep falling over. Uh, welcome to my vertigo. Um, I'm Aaron, the grower. I'm ATG Acres, atgacres.com, ATG Acres on Instagram. Um, I have a fuck ton of shit going on and I look forward to talking to you guys about it tonight. And it's really nice to see the entire panel. I'm happy to, to uh, see everyone. Glad to have you back as well. Next up, Dr. MJ. Hey guys. Yeah, this is Dr. MJ Coco from CocoForCannabis.com. I am excited to have ATG back on the show again tonight and, uh, yeah, it should be another fun and interesting show. So Check me out. I have a YouTube premiere coming up on Tuesday. I just dropped a trailer for that too. So check out my YouTube channel. And of course, find me on CocoForCannabis.com. Doing great things over there on the YouTube. It's growing fast and uh, got quite the community doing great tests and lots of good information over there as well. Uh, next up, we've got Matthew Sink Angel. Yeah. Hey, everyone. This is Matthew Gates. I'm an IPM specialist and I'm looking forward to the talks and if you're interested to know more about pest stuff, you can check me out on Zenthanol, the same account that I'm chatting in right now. Glad to have you back. And next up, Noah V. Groa. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Uh, yeah, I'm Noah V. Groa on Instagram with two E's. You can find me there. And all sweets to everybody and uh, ready to get into it. Speaking of getting into it, make sure you get on into that live chat and don't get caught up in the top chat. If you click on over to like smash that thumbs up button and you come back, oftentimes it clicks you over to the top chat and then you can only see certain messages. It filters out arbitrarily or if there's any swear words or whatever it is, uh, what they think that you don't want to see. So if you go to the live chat, you can make sure to follow along with everybody. But uh, last and certainly not least, who's with us so far, the American one. Hello, Jack panel and everyone in chat. It's good to be here. It's good to see ATG. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to tonight. Uh, I'm the American one on YouTube and the American one underscore with underscore teens on the IGs. And yeah, I'm looking forward to tonight. Excellent. So in the uh, description of the video right now, I've got chat Q&A and first time guests. So at the hour mark, I want to open it up to people who've never been on the show before. I put it out there last week that we're going to have people on. And uh, Doc mentioned that maybe we could have some longtime listeners, no time callers jump in, even if they don't show their face, if they just want to be on in the background and uh, you know, do that, we can make that happen. But before we get into the Q&A, start dropping the questions, by the way, right now in that chat uh, that we just mentioned earlier, so that we can start gathering our questions in our Zoom over here that we will start answering as we go. But one of the topics that Aaron made a post about earlier this week was the harvest drying and curing and a tool that both him and I now use as a measurement. And um, maybe I'll pass it over to him and we could start off just generally talking a little bit about drying and curing and uh, go a little bit around the panel until we gather up some more questions. Cool. Thanks, Jack. Um, let me know if I start lagging out too. Um, I know my connection's not so good, but so the first thing I want to say about drying and curing is, is a really obvious thing. And it's, it's, you know, 60, 60. And with, you know, even with proper equipment, most HVAC systems don't have a setting below 62. And even at set at 62, it's not going to go below, you know, 63, even in like proper, you know, <clears throat> proper, uh, like conditioning. Um, so I want to show you a device that I use to, um, to bring the room down to a cooler temperature as well as that, hum uh, that moisture, uh, meter, that thing's really cool. I was hoping that I get to take you guys into the dry room tonight at some point, um, you know, where we're actually working on trimming some of this first harvest, some of the Sunday driver, um, some of the Baja blast. Blue, blue cookies is, is just finished. So everything that gets harvested is stored in this cold room that stays around 60 degrees and 60% humidity. And I just use a humidifier and a dehumidifier to do that. And um, so it's just a, a series of technology. Uh, Pulse Grow is a really great resource 
they, um, they make a couple of products that you can put in your grow room. A lot of you guys probably know and use this stuff. Um, the pro can monitor CO2. If you want to put it in your grow room, I use a, uh, a pulse one, which is like the original model. It does temperature, humidity, VPD, and light. And I'll put that in my dry room and it makes a perfect monitor system. Um, I can really dial it in there. And I have like 16 foot ceilings and all I use is a window unit. So, you know, th this cool bot that I'm gonna show you that keeps the temperature low is really legit technology. And it's super simple. Um, uses a heater, heats the sensor in your AC, makes it, thinks, makes it think it's warmer than it is and then uh, drives that thing all the way down and it has a module that you can control the temperature so we can get more into that when i when i uh when i go in there with you guys but i'd love to hear everybody else's tips and tricks um uh, from the panel i definitely am a fan of the cool bot or uh, chill bot whatever i've seen people use it for making hash as well and just uh, like you said a lot of commercial air conditioning units like window units may not go as low as people desire to get their temperature. So having something that sort of tricks it into doing that is a cool option. I do think that may lower the longevity of some of the AC units by oh, yeah, them. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. that sort of uh, trade-off, especially in your case, you're not like clocking it down like some hash makers to like the 30s or 40s, like where they're almost freezing the room. You're just getting a few degrees below what is their minimum, which will stress it, but not as much as going 30 degrees lower would yeah. so. exactly. but whenever we talk about these types of topics i think it's nice to just kind of go around the horn and just like in introductions i guess i'll pass it first to spartan grown and see if uh, he has any thoughts on the tips and tricks for uh, um, harvesting drying or curing i'm with aaron the, the i think one of the biggest mistake most home growers are doing right now is not having a dedicated drying space like the repurpose another space and um, I really think it's advantageous to have a space that you have dedicated that you can seal or whatever you want to do to make sure you can hold those. Cause it's important to the, the uh, environmentals. That's, that's the important part of drying and curing. So if you can like dedicate a space that you can build out however you want to, to, to your standards where you can hold that that's super, super key and it can make your life fucking way easier and make it way less of a headache. Um, so I, I really tend to stress that the most to, to most newer growers or even, even seasoned home growers. And once you have your own drying space, then I think the, the traditional 60, 60 is, is, is a good, um, rule of thumb. I like to, when I first put one in, in there, I don't like to take a lot of my leaves off. I like to leave my, my leaves on when I hang dry and I hang whole plant. And, um, because of that, it's going to have a lot of humidity at first that dumps into the room. So I like to actually set my humidity a little bit lower for the first day, maybe two days down to even 50%, 50 to 55%. Just, I like that. It always works well for me to, to dump that humidity quick and then let it come back up to 60% and slow dry after that. Yeah, Sounds like I agree with that too. I'll, I'll say, I don't think that you're going to do any damage like on that front end when you're, when you're dropping the humidity, when it really matters is like when the moisture content of the cannabis actually starts getting like below 50%, that's when you need to be hitting 60%. Right. Correct. Yeah, exactly. And I think exactly. it helps it's with like about having the... things because you, you reduce that huge spike, you know what I mean? By bringing it down a little bit lower at the beginning. Sure. Yeah. We're, uh, I'm involved in get, building out a, a dry room now for a commercial space. And that's what a lot of people that we've spoken to have said, get the most of the, the moisture out in the first 48 to 72 hours. Um, and you're not really worried about the relative humidity that the, the buds are exposed to as much as you're worried about the moisture content, exactly as, as Barton Grun is saying. So initially you can have a, a lower relative humidity. Um, to sort of handle that initial dry down then and but just crank it up again before you know the buds get too dry yeah it's funny i haven't heard very many people say that and uh that's what i've always done i always uh first 24 hours i do about just like spartan said about 50 percent then uh i try and get it. it's hard for me in the environment that i'm in it's hard to get it 
to 60. So I, sometimes it'll be, you know, as close to it as I can get. And then I try and just get the, you know, keep the humidity at that 60 range. And uh, that's what I've always done myself. Yeah, I don't have much to add to all that. They're all pretty much covered it. But if you don't have the wherewithal to have a space that you could control, just find a spot that's as close to those parameters as you can get. And and uh, you could even, at least in my spot right now, it's too humid. So, But if you're in a place that's too dry, you could do things to bring up the humidity in a small space that wouldn't be... Uh, dangerous to to your you know to mold and stuff so in regards to that what tao was just talking about um if i had to sacrifice like a growing space like a tent for example for two weeks as opposed to having no adequate yeah. dry because the tent can be regulated in a number of ways. Like you could just do something as simple as put a wet towel on the floor and have a fan blow over top of that to start pushing RH up. You have your exhaust fan already. You can dial that up and down, hopefully to get it as close to that 60, 60 as you'd like. Um, if you can't do that, I've actually seen people have success with just like a cardboard shipping boxes, like a home Depot box, whatever it is. They just drill like a few holes on the side and, put some fishing line through or whatever wooden dowel rods, how, however they have to hang it in there and you can close it up as much as you need to the point where the RH is in the proper range and maybe have a fan blowing like, you know, the flaps kind of open. Up That's a like really that. solid tip, Jack, because if, in fact, at the end of my dry cycle, no matter what's going on, um, when the moisture contents around like 25%, I bring everything down off the hang rack and I pile it up in little piles about three branches deep. And then I'll let that sit for anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. And then I'll flip that for another 24 to 48 hours. And then it gets bagged and cured. So that's an important tip to, to really somehow, you know, make moisture stop leaving so quickly at the end. Yeah. Cause if it gets too dry where it like flashes, it starts to sometimes get that hay or uh, I don't know, unpleasant smells can be associated yeah. with that. And I think even molds are, uh, Thing, botrytis and things like that can develop if it's either too high or even in some cases i think like too low it might attract certain i don't know if it's a mold or just a unwanted volatile organic compound that sticks around but i think we've all smelled like that wet grass like hay smelling bud and i think it can be attributed sometimes to a improper drying cure process too quick of a dry if it gets if it starts feeling like it gets too dry or if it's like that borderline with a stem snap and you have like way too many that you have to trim if it's in like that bendable, dry enough, but not too dry, I'll put them in those those metal tins, like uh, ATG acres the same, like three deep of branches. And then I'll put that in a turkey bag so that that moisture will be like a little bit a constant and won't totally dry out to brittleness at least. And then when you get to it, you can work it. And even then, if you depending on how sealed it is, if it gets too dry, you could just put some fresh big fan leaves on top of the branches and put it in a turkey bag for a little while and it'll re-moisten and i find that to help sometimes when it's too brittle it's like if you're trimming dry trimming in the sunlight i see the, the trichomes flying off that's no good so yeah that's what i do sometimes i've done did we lose tower or is it me Oh, did I did I just say that? No one I think heard you me? muted. I'm it, it cut out probably. I think, I think he oh. said I'm done. Yeah, I think I might have been finished with what I little rant there. Yeah, yeah. He just okay. Yeah, yeah. that's my bad. I um, was in the process of pulling up a share screen because um, I haven't necessarily thrown out what I do right uh, currently for my drying and curing process. But here's one of Aaron's posts that I think brought me into uh, talking about this topic. With this, I think it's called a Tav Wool meter. I'll go to my Instagram. I have a post that I made. I think it's my second most recent post about this particular meter. It's a wood moisture meter. And I'm not going to say that it's perfect, but I do like that it gives you an exact percentage and a number. And if you have a consistent SOP, um, like one guy said, he takes three buds and kind of squishes them into a little brick and then pushes the pins through three buds because if your buds are too airy, this doesn't necessarily get as accurate of a reading as if you take like a few buds and swish them into each other. But um, I found with this, I dry until uh, 
between 12 and 14 percent before jarring 10 to 12 percent is like the ideal range for me for smoking consuming it um i see stuff like i, I wrote here seven to ten percent i found it's acceptable and then some stuff that you find is overdrive from like the dispensaries will be like three to five percent which is like it dusts to a powder we've all seen that overdrive stuff that is a uh, not the most ideal but these little tough wool meters are only like 20 bucks 26 bucks on amazon i think when i got it and i'm not sponsored by them but i have used it with uh, a lot of success and happiness and to throw a monkey wrench into the chain of things i used to dry at 60 60 and i even got a uh, well as close as i could get to 60 60 using a, a hang dry in a tent and then i on 421 a curador and a giveaway which keeps a perfect 60 60 so i started drying in that um and then one of my listeners of the show uh they sent me an herbs now to test out because they loved it so much and they're like hey there's a lot of people talking smack on this like I see you're kind of skeptical. I'd love it for you to test one and just let me know what you think. So they sent one to me and I tested it against my hang dry. I tested it against my curador, which is a perfect 60, 60. And then I did the herbs now. And especially since I've gotten that meter, that Tavool meter that I just showed, I've never over dried it a single time. And it cuts the process down from two week drying to four and a half days for me up to five days on the long end. And, uh, I don't know, since I've started using it, no one's complained or asked like, Hey, are you using a herbs now dryer? <laughs> or, uh, it looks like a food dehydrator. So people call it a food dehydrator who've never used it before. And if you look at the temperature, I'll take a laser gauge to it. And it's in the seventies, which, uh, as somebody who's done the terpene research, I get a little upset to see that it's above 68 because I know at 68, certain terpenes start to flash off. But if you go and look at Scott underscore herbs now's page, or if you look at, uh, I Grow Eat Easy or a few others that have done side-by-side -side testing. They did 60-60 hang dry against their herbs now. And in several of those instances got better results, both THC and terpenes with their herbs now dry. So not to say it it's sounds like it's scientific, a, but I think it's, it's a better option for like, you know, if you, if you have a, a rest of your life going on, you know, like if you can't be in your dry room, like six times a day, checking your stuff and making sure, um, and I'd like to share a couple of tips about the moisture meter before we move on past it. Um, I had I had some failures with it when I would shove it into a bud that was like not connected to the other bud that was that the prongs were going into. So you, but I had a lot of success if I found a really big bud and I shoved it in there. Um, moisture content for testing starts at fifteen percent. So you don't you, they're not going to test your stuff above 15%. If they do, they'll have to retest it. So, um, you know, you want to bring your stuff in for testing if you're on a commercial market uh, below 15%. Um, because then that's, that's a sensible spot because that's like preventing mold from growing in your, in your finished product. Um, in my opinion, 15% is a little bit too wet to bag up. Like you were saying, seven to 10% is acceptable. Um, in my opinion, about 13% is time to like start you know, getting it closer together, like I was saying earlier. And then, you know, it, wherever you like it from there, if you like a 10% or if you like a 12%, I personally like around 12%. Um, but everybody's got their own moisture, you know, desires. And this thing is really fun to play with for the price. It's, it's too interesting to not have in my, in my book. It's like, you can get that sticky texture where it kind of sticks to your fingers all the way to like, uh, more of like it breaks up easier for a joint and it's a little bit more like powdery, I guess, uh, to all the way to like a dust and everything in between. But the other tip with the meter is I would say avoid stems. If you press it into the stem, I've even seen some people say test the stem. I'm like, I'm not smoking the mm -hmm. stem, so I'm not testing mm -hmm. the stem. I'm sorry um, to people out there that think that's the best solution. I get that it's meant to measure wood. It's probably not the most perfect thing to measure a flower that's like cannabis, but also, I mean, stems are, are really skinny and those prongs are not like they're not like pins. They're like, you know, they're like bulky. You got to show. Yeah. Them. They're not like hypodermic needles. No. They're sharp. Yeah. They're sharp as hell though. They'll poke you and make you bleed. If the first yes. time I opened it up, I <laughs> cut myself on it. And I will say it can pierce accidentally, especially if you've got a stemmy mm -hmm. kind of nug that it's got like a bunch of little stems in there and you pierce into it and you're like, this reading seems weird. Take it out and then stick it back in somewhere else in the bud and mm -hmm. see if you get more of a consistent, if you're getting like 12%, 12%, 12%, 12%, and then you get one that's like 21%, you're like, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. Try it again and figure out if there was maybe some error in the use of the process. But yeah, I definitely think it's a cool thing just to have because 
if nothing else, you get to learn what you prefer. Like if it's 13, 14, nine, you figure out a percentage that is pretty consistent from one bud to the next, which is helpful. Because otherwise, I think a lot of people kind of go on like, uh, does the stem snap? Or is it like uh, crunchy on the outside and spongy on the inside? I've heard 30 different descriptions from 30 different growers on when exactly is the right time to take it from the hang to right, it gives you the dry. Number. It gives you a number, whether it's, it's accurate or not, it gives you a number that's repeatable that you can compare against itself. So it gives you something. So it's better than just shooting in the dark. Yeah, and it's measuring the right thing. I mean, it's measuring the moisture content of the buds, which is what we're really interested in when we're drying in the first place. I like it. And as long as you're consistent with it, like Jack was saying, your SOPs are on point, and you're doing the same thing every time, you're going to get consistent results. Yeah, it's, it's pretty scary accurate at the point, like once you do have a consistent thing, it's nice to have a, a tool that works when you feed it a consistent input and get mm -hmm. a relatively accurate output. Um, but I do have a question. I think Matthew probably already answered it in the chat, but Rowdy420 says, Zenthanol, do ladybugs eat fungus gnat larvae? I did, and the answer is they do not. I don't know any that do, at least. And there's, you know, I always like to say it when we talk about lady beetles. Um, uh, in the collective consciousness, we think of lady beetles as like the archetypical biocontrol. It's bright. It's easy to see. Uh, we grow some people at least grow up, uh, you know, seeing the adults eating aphids and things like that. But it's important to know that most aphids that you'll get, sorry, most lady beetles that you'll get um, through commercial channels are going to be ones that eat aphids specifically. There are some that eat specialized organisms like uh, Stathoris punctillum goes after the spider mites, like the ones you might get in cannabis, like the two spot spider mite. Um, but you can't really expect the other ones to like be an adequate counter, you know, so there's some that go after mealybugs or some that go after and even eat fungi for that matter. Um, there's a silabora that goes after powdery mildew even. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of lady beetles out there, super diverse group. Most eat aphids though, and some of them are even not great for your environment and are uh, invasive. So, uh, be careful, be responsible and, um, you know, don't use them misappropriately. I have another question from the same individual, Rowdy420. And just a reminder, everybody, if you want to put a question up there, we will do our best to answer it. So it's not just Rowdy420 that gets to ask them. So if you have a question uh, or something you're curious about, we'd be more than happy to answer it. Just uh, go ahead and drop them in the comments and we'll get to as many as we can. They ask, during flower and your buds are putting on weight and then they seem to stop. And I guess just ripen, question mark. Is there something you're supposed to do at that time? And since it was tagged to at Spartan Grown, I'll pass it to Spartan Grown first before everybody else can jump in on that. Yeah, I forgot to tag what it looks like. But yeah, my answer back was was in, in organics. I'm just giving water at that time. So I'm not really doing anything special. Um, even in uh, synthetics, if you're at that time where it stops like that, I usually stop, I'm, I'm either slowing down or flushing at that point, even in synthetics. Uh, it's pretty much ripened and getting ready, you know, getting ready to be done. It doesn't require a whole lot of nutrition at the end, I don't think. I think at that point, if you add nutrition, what you're adding, if it gets uptaken, which it might, but if it gets uptaken, it's just, it's just not going to account to any kind of extra super growth in the end. So it's a waste of money if you do that late. I tend to agree with you there. I'm usually just given water only usually through a lot of the grow, if not the entire grow, but uh, especially at that time, it's kind of just uh, relax and wait and enjoy until they get to harvest, watch the smells change, watch them get a little fatter each day. You can maybe take measurements somehow. I don't know, get it like a measuring tape or a ruler and see how much fatter it gets. Cause it might look like there's not much going on, but if you actually uh, go in there and look, there is substantial growth um, that's happening. Even if it's just a little bit of swelling. So yeah, what mount the, a camera in your tent and take a picture every day and, and run it through and you'll see the, the buds sort of fattening and developing. I mean, it's definitely true that they stop vertical growth after the, the bolting period, but they should still, I mean, the buds themselves will be growing up pretty much until the plant gets taken down. I would say um, 
I don't disagree with, with the things you guys have said. Um, I would just add this perspective. Um, I've seen a lot of success with at that phase, you know, we're talking what, like week six, week seven, something like that. Um, if you're running like a nine weeker or 10 weeker, um, it's when things start to, you know, ripen. Um, I, at that point, I usually start to turn up potassium and sulfur. So any, any way I can get sulfur into the plants, usually gypsum or um, Epsom salts, um, really cranks up the terpenes at the end of the run. I know a lot of people are a big fan of flush. I think that's sort of old school technology or synthetic technology, maybe, you know, flushing synthetic fertilizers out of, you know, salts out of your medium. But um, in my experience, I've seen really high terpene numbers with high sulfates at the end of the run there. Anybody else want to jump in on this topic uh, or do we want to get to some other questions? We've got a few more piled up. No, they got it. That's about it. Just water only at that point, I would think too. There's an interesting comment before I get to some questions. Keystone Cop says, in hardwood lumber, the ends of freshly sawn boards are sealed to slow the loss of moisture. I've sometimes thought that sealing stem ends might help mitigate rapid moisture loss. Interesting comment, interesting thought. Curious if anyone on the panel has any thoughts on that, because we do really, I mean, especially if you're not doing a whole plant hang where you're doing a single chop and then flipping the plant, hanging it from like that one point. A lot of people cut individual stems off and they'll hang them up one by one or whatever, however they have to do it. So I'm curious, uh, do you guys have any thoughts on, do you think that could potentially be a method to slow down the loss of moisture in cannabis drying? I think there's a lot of surface area elsewhere, but still quite a bit of water is probably lost out that stem. So if you blocked that, um, you would block that path for water to, to sort of vacate the, the plant. Um, but there's a lot of surface area on the flower. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure like how much it would slow it down, but, but I think it would. And I, you know, you'd have to want to do that because you're living, you know, you're probably in a dry climate or something else and, and you're struggling to, to slow down the dry. I, I don't think this is most people's problem. Yeah. I would say if that's the issue, I would just leave all the stems on the, I would leave it a whole plant. And I was going to mention that if you can't have that controlled drying area, and it's too dry, I, I would be apt to leave the whole plant and leave some even fan leaves on it. If it's stupid dry out, you know, you leave it all on. That'll help uh, not let it get too dry too quick. And the opposite, if it's really humid out, take off as much as you can and chip it down to uh, even sizes and, uh, you know, get the airflow through it so that it doesn't have mold or anything kind of issues possibly. possibly. That's a great point. Um, Potent Ponics dropped a question and I've seen some products like this, but I've never personally used them, but I wanted to throw it to you guys on here and maybe the other people in the chat will see the question more now when we talk about it. But uh, have you guys tried dry tubes? They make a breathable cardboard tube now with humidity gauges on the top. Uh, and that's like one product, but I, th I think there's also like the cure tube. And then there was even like groove or grove bags, which claim to keep the humidity within like 58 to 60 two percent rh or something like that so i'm curious if anybody's tried those and um, yeah just general thoughts because i have not tried any of them uh, the bags, bags are good i like drove bags i liked them um what was the one you said hey, what'd you say aaron that you liked uh zip zag zip zag bags are really, really good. good i like those a lot dude they're static treated they're freaking they're just a bomb, dude. They feel like turkey bags, but they have a zipper and the zipper feels way stronger than a Ziploc. It's got a, you can like vac seal these bags. Um, can you talk about why black. static's important? I know, but I, just for the people they listening. The trikes don't stick to the bag, man. So yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, it rips uh, for anybody out there who doesn't know if you've ever seen you know, a pound bag or whatever turkey bag when it's completely emptied, there's a bunch of hairs and trichomes and a ton of what would be good consumable medicine stuck to the bag. So the anti-static bag that you said zip zag is the brand there, Aaron. Yeah, actually. So I just became a rep for them. So hit me up if you need zip zag bags, I have wholesale pricing and stuff. Um, I, I'm, I'm on their team. Good stuff. And you're using them personally now. Cause I, I you've always kind of loved the Turkey bag. I think you were a tote Turkey yeah. bag kind of guy and it, that yeah. was your method. Yep. And these are basically turkey bags with a zipper on them. 
and, and static treated. So in my mind, and you know, it's, they're, they're obviously quite a bit more expensive than turkey bags, but they beat those grow bag prices. So uh, that appeals to me and probably will appeal a lot of the people that like the stuff that I like. Is it doing anything to maintain or like adjust the humidity? Cause I think the Grove bag, that was sort of one of the things they were marketing is that they kept it within a certain humidity, but I don't know if a turkey bag does that naturally or if there's anything the zip tag does. I don't know anything about that, but I know that whatever moisture content you put in there is the moisture content that comes out when you open it. That's they good. It's like got, a jar. Uh, they even got blacked out bags, which I really like. They came out with those recently, yeah. which was pretty fucking cool. I like that. Or an amber jar. Like I'm a mason jar person, but I will say even mason jars, if you could de-static a mason jar somehow, I'm not sure if there's a method for that. <laughs> that would... But my mason jars are covered in resin. And I if you too. don't wash them between different crops, the one crop before might make the crop going in start to taste like the past one if it was a really super terpy strain. So something to consider. But yeah, the uh, amber... I that's not really a problem though is it jack or yeah it is i mean it depends i guess if you have if a you really that had a nasty smell that you didn't like you could rinse with some the grain alcohol. Alcohol. or like, like my wife didn't alcohol. like x strain that we right. harvested and then like we get y that she loves but then we put it into that jar and start smelling like x I gotcha. I gotcha. but yeah i'm a big fan of the just amber mason jars i know some people like uh sequence he likes to gift people like the infinity jars or whatever those like really dark black i think it's called myron or something like that it's like a super dark black jar some of the hash you get now comes in it um some jars they paint black to yes. block out light so uh sequence bought me shout out to sequence or cover them in the outside with duct tape i cover the bag i cover the jars up with a towel or, or obviously just put them in a cupboard or anything like that yeah yeah out of the light because for anybody who doesn't know the main things that are going to degrade your cannabis are heat uh oxygen which is why you're sealing it. And then uh, sunlight. The sunlight is able to literally degrade it as well as oxygen and heat. Um, and I, I believe time is also part of that equation. But those are the big four. They're going to degrade your stuff. And uh, when you're coming to drying and curing, trying to preserve, that's what you're going to try to avoid. For what it's worth, uh, you know, I agree with all of that. But I, I think that we can get carried a bit too extreme with like the the sealing, the the light sealing our jars right like you wouldn't want to put your buds out in the sun to like dry like raisins um you wouldn't want to leave your jar out in the sun either but like just incidental light in your room that like is coming in through the glass in the jar it's it's gonna have a very very minuscule sort of impact on the degradation of the buds i mean just considering the number of photons that are sort of bombarding them in in those conditions but uh, those um, those uv protected um containers were kind of in vogue a few years ago i have to say but i agree with they, you they, I mean, that's not right. that's not a that's i mean not a if you're gonna be leaving right, it out in a course. picnic out in the sun <laughs> then yeah right. if you, you have glass like, windows glass kitchen, blocks most uv be, you know glass. Glass. that's, that's true yeah right. so come on and then on top of that the, the thing that would concern me more if you have it just sitting out is the temperature if you've left your stuff in totally. a car even if it's not in the sun if it's a hot day you get right. back to that car and you bust that jar open it, it stinks like the best weed ever because all the terpenes have flashed off of the bud and now you're smelling it in the jar but if it's yeah. when you pull it out of my curador at 60 degrees and you smell it it has a subtle smell because it hasn't volatized as much but when you grind it up and put it on the tray and it's sitting out at 68 70 80 degrees it starts to smell a lot more and um i do agree that the the light is minuscule but over time like People do keep their stuff up to a year, sometimes more, and um, we grew it. We want to preserve it as much as possible. So I don't think that it's like too I, I difficult agree. to go. I just think in the in the scheme of things, like the the temperature and the humidity, and you know, preserving it from oxygen, as you mentioned, are all like much bigger than like making sure that it's completely sealed from light. Um, at that point, you're getting into you know the the diminishing returns but absolutely it's your baby you can you can keep track of it and keep care of it you know it's that 0.01 percent probably that we're reaching for or whatever but the uh, one thing that i didn't i felt like it was a bridge too far for me i got argon gas with uh, yeah. my curador to spray into the jars to re it's heavier than oxygen so it replaces the oxygen to prevent oxidization there, yeah. but i was like i don't know what argon it's supposed to be i think odorless and tasteless but i just when you start spraying chemicals around like 
it's probably it's a noble gas or whatever. It's but, an unreactive like, noble gas. You're gonna put a current through it. You're probably okay. Yeah, yeah I'm, no, I'm you're probably you're fine with argon. It's not gonna hurt you. But yeah, I, I agree. I don't think it's necessary. I think that that's you know we're we're chasing ghosts at that point. Where earlier in this process, you know, a lot of home growers at least have already lost a lot because of their lack of dry equipment and their their you know poor drying practices and a lot of that's just dictated you know this is one of the areas where probably most commercial spaces um have an advantage over most home growers because they just have the, the technology they have the equipment to be able to create the the dry room space um you know like aaron's talking about most of us don't have 60 degrees available to us other than like in our refrigerators at, at home um like we're not going to unless we have a dedicated air conditioning unit for our dry space the idea of just sort of like drawing in cool air from the house nobody's going to be keeping their house at like 58 degrees with an air conditioner in like the summer in florida or something I and mean, that's just not happening right so a, a lot of the the home growers are are sort of dealing with suboptimal conditions in the dry and there's a lot of hacks. And I think that it's important for us <laughs> to like talk about those hacks because most people can't afford to like buy, you know, an air conditioner that can keep their dry space down to 60 degrees and have two-way humidity control in that dry space. So that's what's great is whatever, if you're willing to be at 60 degrees, doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter. It does depend on how insulated your house is or your dry space is, but you can get this cool bot and it's 400 bucks. And you can hook it up in about 10 minutes. And that alone, so me, Aaron, is enough to make it inaccessible to 80% of home growers aren't going to spend 400 bucks on something just to cool their area maybe, down okay, just to dry. Well, then the 20 well, well, they have to have a dedicated air conditioner it, at least for that room. Wouldn't you need a dedicated I mean, no, air conditioner you do it at least house. for that room, Aaron? You could do it for your house. I mean, if you had if you had a... You, no, actually, I'm sorry. Yes, you need a, either a mini split. You need to have contact with the fins at this source of the cold. So like... Right. It, it does need to be like a mini split or a or window unit. Yeah, you're right. Right. So if you're just set up, if you have like a, a central air conditioner in your house or whatever, you don't even have that in your grower. I mean, um, yeah, but, I'll, but a lot of people have window units. I mean, I've seen plenty of growers with window units. Oh, I agree. And I think it's a cool hack for people that do. I just think a lot of people don't. I mean, a, a lot of, a lot of growers I deal with don't have an air conditioner that they can use just for their dry. You know what I mean? So I, I like that that um, device. And I've looked at a lot of different sort of sensors. There's other ways that, to sort of feed that information, but that's a cool one. And that's a cool hack um, for people that have an air conditioner, situation. right? But that's what do you do if you really can't get your dry space below 70 um, and you know, you're struggling with a really dry or a really wet environment or something, I, you know, most growers will invest to grow the buds, but it's harder to invest a bunch of money for that dry room. I don't see why. I mean, I get that, like there's priorities, but like you save up money for your next biggest purchase. Why not make this the next biggest purchase if you care? And if there yeah, are people no, I, that care. I, I agree. And I think that we're shedding some light on the fact that, you know, if you think you've got everything for your grow set up, you, you probably don't, or you may not have everything set up yes. for the ideal dry room situation. And, and that would be the best place to probably turn to, to increase the quality of your, your final harvest. Well, here's one kind of hack that I used in that situation where I didn't have the ability electronic, electrical wise to run, you know, just to have an AC for my grow and AC for my dry room. So what I did is I put the AC in my dry room. And then I put a, um, an exhaust fan from my dry room into my grow. And I use my dry room as a, as a uh, what would you call that? A long, room. long room? Long room, basically, yeah. That's smart. Keep my, dry, keep my dry room at a low 60. And then, you know, my fan triggers on anytime the, you know, the flower room gets warm. It just dumps 60 degree air into the, into the flower room so that's what i did to solve that double ac issue for myself that's great energy efficiency too that's awesome spartan that's smart. i like to see when people do even like a similar thing with their flower room ventilating to like their uh bedroom because the flower room wants to be a little bit lower humidity and then it could dump that into the bedroom which wants the higher humidity and allow it to you know be beneficial it, it can handle the heat it can handle the higher humidity and benefit from that where the flower room is going to have a detriment 
So being creative with the ventilation is definitely important, but I think, um, and this isn't like a shot at you guys. I like home growers to have the biggest setups that they can and grow as much cannabis as they can. But most home growers that I talk to have less than a thousand dollar setup maybe. And they're growing just a couple of plants where I think you guys are probably on the like larger end scale, maybe of a home grow. And um, I would say of the hundred people that DM me a week, uh, five of them have an AC and 95 do not. And it's uh, unfortunate that maybe they don't, have the ability to get it or the desire or planning to make that drying space as important as other stuff in the grow. But there are other options out there. Like I was just at Home Depot for something non-related to cannabis. And I walked just down the aisle and I saw literally the exact same unit. This is like, I love Curador. They hooked me up, but the unit that they sell is just a wine refrigerator down to the lock and key on the bottom, down to the blue light at the top and the up temperature and down every single button on the entire unit is the same thing. You go to Home Depot, go to Best Buy, look through their wine fridges. If you have an attentive eye, pull up Curador, pull up wine fridge, you'll see they're literally the same same size. You can even get smaller ones if you don't have a huge cannabis harvest for way less, like in the $100 ranges that even like a mini fridge, an old mini fridge on Craigslist uh, can be good to store your cannabis if you're looking to have long-term preservation because the heat alone is going to degrade a lot of people's stuff. And like Doc was saying, uh, RH, if people don't have the RH in line, I'm not a huge fan of the Integra or the uh, Ovita packs personally. I used to use them and try them, but uh, a lot of people kind of question, do they steal the Terps or like impart their own flavor onto the bud? And I think that if you can just get away with a jar and that's a good way to go about it. Smart Poker likes to bring up the uh, Canatrol, but I think that's not necessarily on the cheap home grow end of the spectrum. It's a really cool product, but I think it uh, is definitely more expensive. So I just want to throw out those couple few other options for uh, how to preserve and keep temperatures lower without necessarily having to air condition. Like where I live in San Diego, we just use air uh, fans. Like you can hear my fan running in the background. This isn't a grow fan. This is a window fan. And uh, it's not because I can't afford air conditioning. I, I, can, I used to have an air conditioning unit, but I'm trying to keep my footprint as low as possible. And like, we don't necessarily need AC. So I just don't run it for anything for myself, for my cats, animals, or plants. And I can manage to have crops that I'm very happy with without necessarily needing an AC. So there are other options and you could try in your curator if you wanted to. But like I said, I actually prefer the herbs now. And most of the time that's operating at 70 degrees for a few days. So I think it's worth trying multiple things and figuring out what works best for you. Because a lot of the time people went like 60, 60, the whole entire dry. And then they found out like Spartan said earlier, if you start at 50 degrees and get a lot of that moisture out in the beginning, uh, you can actually have a better dry, but Noah's got his hand up and I've been rambling. So Noah jump in. Yeah. I was just going to say, um, I totally agree with everything you say there. Um, but, um, let me also say that, uh, getting some type of a small AC, even if like, like right now I got, it's like literally where I'm living right now, it's almost a hundred degrees a day. And I got like a little teeny, like, ac unit and it's like my my temperature in my house is like 77 so any type of temperature if you can get even like a cheap ac they sell used ones i'm telling you if you can get that temperature down in the summer it, the difference that you're going to see is night and day i get it not everybody can do it but if there's a way and you can do it i recommend trying doing it that's what i'm going to say like bro i'm not fucking rich I am broke. Oh, me neither, bro. I am making this shit happen. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm pulling this shit out of my ass. I swear to God. And you can too. It's all, you know, like, I get that 95% of people might not be interested in the cool bot. Um, but the 5% of people that would, I, you know, I'd be happy for them to DM me if they want to learn more. I actually have to go, guys. Um, I'm going to sign off. I hope to see you guys again really soon. I appreciate you letting me jump on as per usual. And uh, it was good uh, to see I, you, Aaron. Yeah, thank, thank, you, Aaron. thank you for coming on very yeah, good thank you always, man. And, and helpful man i've been watching Likewise. your room Aaron. you're kicking ass man keep it up dude i know Crushing thank you it. brother yeah, um, to see you, man. i am atg acres that is atg acres.com atg acres on instagram hit me up with any questions i will try and get to you love y'all peace grow with love Aaron. peace and love Aaron. Yeah. thank you so much yeah and if you guys are interested uh aaron and i have done videos on my youtube channel sentinel about um various topics it's been very fun it's been like a year or so since then he's been very busy um establishing himself and cultivating 
up a storm. But yeah, we've talked about cool stuff like how insects see and detect your plants and other cool stuff like that. So you should check out that series. It's my HG Acres uh, interview series. I didn't even see his message. He, he had written that earlier. I felt like I scared or chased him off by disagreeing with him, but he said that he had to go at seven earlier. So I don't feel as bad now, but I, I didn't want to make it seem like the 95 out of hundred people who DM me, DM me is representative of the entire cannabis community or home growers in general. That's just my anecdotal experience. I'm just sharing like how, you know, the community that I've interacted with shares, but I think that it is, is important that we talk about this stuff. And if you do want to get a cool bot, hit up Aaron and uh, ask him about more information and where to get it, because it's a incredible piece of technology that, you know, I just learned about it a few years ago and I've seen hash makers that put it to great use too, and you can use it in your grow. So there's definitely lots of uh, potential there. So I just try to give a, as much perspective as possible and, and try and uh, hope, hopefully help people realize that everybody comes from their own position and uh, not everyone's going to have access to the same resources, but the go into the air conditioning topic, like Noah, you mentioned that you could get a cheap one. The one yeah. thing I would warn is um, I, I do like the saying quality is cheaper in the long run. Cause I, I fucked myself a little bit. I got a cheap one on Craigslist, like one of those roll around units. I would go with a, a window <laughs> unit versus the roll around one, unless yeah. you can properly ventilate the exhaust from it. Cause it puts a lot of heat into the other area. But on top of that, it wasn't super efficient. So it cranked my light bill or my electric bill, I guess. It was more expensive to run the air conditioning than the entire grow combined. So like my bill was like a 150 a month. Before I started growing, it was like 50. Then it went to 150. And it's been pretty consistent about 150. And then I started using that unit for one month. It went to 265. So it added $115 in a single month. And I only ran it like a handful of days. So I was like, damn, I really got a shitty, shitty old inefficient one. So if you can invest yes. and get a a decent one up front that is semi-efficient and more modern. Um, even if it is used, that's a, a big money saver there. Yeah, for sure. The portable air conditioners, none of them are very efficient. They all have drawbacks. It's always better, I think, to get a, a window unit or a mini split. Um, you know, and mini splits are really the preferred option for grow tents um or rooms like that because you don't have to have a window and sort of vent it right outside you can split those units separately um but yeah i agree with you jack i just i mean I, you know i talk to a ton of growers all the time too that like aren't going to be able to spend the money for that at least not on their first several harvests um you know they need proof of concept before they can sort of continuously invest in this project so um it, it's cool and i, I like learning about those kinds of tricks for growers that have the budget to to build that out but we also got to think like what do you do if you don't right what do you do if you live in in your house jack you don't have air conditioning it's going to be you know 80s and 90s and you got a, a crop coming down like how do you how do you dry that how do you do the best job you can you know with, with the equipment that you have available um like we talked about what do you do if it's you know to dry out, um, and I agree, you know, leave as much leaves on the plant as you can during the dry to sort of slow stuff down, leave the whole plant together. Um, I think the opposite's true too. If you're growing someplace that it's, it's you know, way too wet out, um, do a wet trim. Um, if you're really living in a really wet environment and you can't lower that humidity, um, you should trim your whole crop, I would say, wet, not, not hang it up with any leaves and, and dry it naked. Um, but temperature is just a hard one, man. I mean, it's, if you don't have air conditioning, it, it's tough. Um, and you know, I've cured buds in the mid seventies. Um, you still have inner movement, right? At least a fan air movement. Yeah. You know, I've got cured buds in the high seventies and you can tell a difference for sure than the buds that were cured in the sixties. Um, but you still get high off of them. So you just got to do the best you can in, in some situations. Yep. We've got a, a few uh, questions. Tao dropped this one in the chat from Archie B. Groen or B. Groen. How many thrips are a problem and what is a good Benny for SoCal? I'm assuming they're asking like a good beneficial insect for Southern California, and I'll pass that to Matthew. Yeah, so I mentioned that um, there's a bunch of thrips out there. There's over 6,000 species. And so there's probably some we have. 
every one. <laughs> every single called. one, yeah. <laughs> um, it turns out, so there's Western flower thrips, which is a big pest of many crops, and cannabis is one of them. Um, that's the most that's the most common one that uh, I encounter. But there's documentations of onion thrips. There's documentations of what are called greenhouse thrips, which are kind of a little bit larger, bulkier, kind of a black color. And then there are some that are like, um, there's like a black and white spotted thrips of various kinds. And I've seen, I've seen examples of that in different places. So those could be all the same species. It could be different species with similar looks, not always possible to tell um, visually from those markings. Um, all of them pretty much have similar vulnerabilities to like, for example, um, for beneficials, uh, there are predatory mites like Swirsky and Cucumerus, which I like to utilize for them. Those work best on the smaller quote unquote thrip species like Western flower thrips and onion thrips. Um, they are not as effective against the larger thrips like greenhouse thrips. So there is, there is that to consider. So knowing the difference between those two is pretty easy to tell the difference, even just naked, you know, unaided. Because one, the first two I mentioned uh, Western flower thrips and onion thrips have like a cream color. They're kind of like, they kind of point, they're kind of pointed at the end of their body and they're kind of pointed at the, at the top of their body. So they're kind of cigar shaped in that way. Um, and they're kind of, uh, yeah, like yellow, like almost like a cream whitish or some sort of orangish color. And then the greenhouse thrips are like a dark black color, or maybe even like a slate gray color sometimes. Matthew, will green lace wings or their larvae eat uh, thrips? Yeah, definitely. The the green lace wing larvae are generalists and they'll eat they'll definitely eat thrips. And they're really like really big and much more massive. So I would say they could probably also contend with those larger thrips nymphs. Because usually the predatory mice go after the immature stages and they don't really go after the adult stages so much. Um, which not a lot of people realize, but that does definitely, that definitely plays a role in, um, you know, application efficacy and that kind of thing. But the lace wing larvae are huge in comparison, so they can overpower their target a little bit easier. But the green lace wing adults, they, I'm pretty sure they only eat uh, nectar and pollen. They don't really eat um, prey as much. The brown lace wing lar uh, larvae and adults, they are both predaceous, both stages of life. What about our good buddy, the pirate bug? He'll fuck up a thrip. I know it. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. I'll fuck up you too. <laughs> <laughs> they do Stay sometimes. Bite. In the I haven't had it really happen myself. I think maybe I once yeah, or either. twice, but um, I think we're. I think it knows we're cool. Like I think it we have an understanding. It. Our protection yeah. magic is strong, Matthew. Exactly. It just radiates out. <laughs> <laughs> I like to also Actually, throw in fungi if I can. If it's like an important crop, like cannabis, I like to throw in some some kind of fungi action to either get them in the in the soil um, or uh, do a foliar spray with it and, and try to get like uh, BB maybe something like that. That's a really important point. The um, those sort of like in, those uh, pupa like stages will fall off into the soil or onto the ground, so. Um, sometimes you don't always get them with some sort of predatory mite or, or insect or something like that. So hit them with the Bouveria is a good choice. Um, yeah. I've got another good question from Lord Blueberry in the chat. It says, at Chief Home Grow, can you talk about how to par map your growing space? And I'm going to hand that off to Doc. Yeah, I answered this in the chat, but, um, you know, find a par map that that's from a space that's the same size as your your growing space. So your grow tent or your grow room. Um, and, you know, knowing a bit about how the tests are done in terms of, you know, how they were set up and whether or not they used reflective walls to map match your sort of grow space. But a lot of part tests, like part tests I do, for example, are done in, a, in an area with reflective walls that really mimic a grow tent. And it's a whole lot easier to, to test the light in that testing area than it would be like actually in your tent. So that's really the purpose of a PAR map is to be able to see what kind of light you're going to get in that particular space at a given height. Um, the PAR map should tell you how big the space was and how high the fixture was hung above the canopy. Um, 
And, you know, you go with that, you assume that you're going to get a similar performance out of that fixture in your space if you, you have a same size space. Now, the size of the space matters a great deal. Um, you know, going from like a, a three by three tent to a four by four tent, um, that's, you know, nine to 16 square feet. That's a, a big difference in terms of area. And we're dealing with quantities and densities distributed across an area. It's really important to, to make sure the area is the same. Um, but yeah, that's that's exactly how I expect people to use the maps that I produce, to, to match them up with the same size tent that they have, and then to be able to see, okay, I'm gonna hang this at the same height, and this is what I'm gonna get in the middle, and this is what I'm gonna get in the corner. I would say if you have an LED light that's been made in the last like three to five years, I would go check out cocoforcannabis.com's grow light calculator because there's a chance that it's already been tested in a space that might be similar to yours. Or uh, Shane at MyGrow has also done a pretty large handful of tests. So you can have a decent idea of what um, bar map you're putting out. And just a second, what doctors said, a three by three versus a four by four, you know, it doesn't seem like one, one foot difference. <laughs> when you hear it or look at it on paper. But like you said, nine square feet versus 16 square feet, that's seven additional square feet. You're almost doubling the area that you're having to cover by light. That's a huge deal. So it's something very, very much worth accounting for. And speaking of yeah. uh, accounting for, I want to account for Keystone, who is Keystone Cops, I believe, who asked a cool question earlier and I'm adding them into the call right now. So. Uh, cheers to Keystone. Audio is connecting. Hopefully, uh, everything's going to be all good with the Zoom. Sometimes with the first time callers, we have some issues, but uh, we'll go ahead and I can. Um, there we go. Oh, we've turned it around. I'll go ahead and spotlight you now since you're going to be showing off the garden. I wasn't sure if you were trying to. Let's see here. Spotlight for everyone. Boom. Oh, Welcome you, in, Keystone. You, cheers. You know what, Jack? I'm just. Um... I'm sorry, I'm struggling with the tech a little bit. Let me just turn the background blur off real quick. There we go. Oh, yeah. Right. Much better. That was pretty uh, trippy for a second, though. That was cool. Yeah. yeah. So, Good old Zoom. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, hi, everyone. Nice to talk to all of you. Um, I thought I'd show you my setup. Um, maybe you want to see that because it's cheap home grow, and this is um, not exactly a cheap setup but um some of it's like diy um a lot of it i pulled from ideas that doc has on his website so um yeah uh so i've got uh good Kista. so i've got an hlg 600r as my light that's the big spend that's not a cheap light i did get that on sale but um that's like almost 900 bucks now um and then I'm in Coco and I've got um, high frequency fertigation. So there's a tank outside of the tent with a pump and, uh, and a timer out there. And then um, instead of doing individual draining pots, self-draining pots, what I did was um, this is a litter tray that you can get at any pet store. And this is like 15 bucks and it's like 30 by 30. Um, so it, like in it. a four by four tent, it covers a lot. Like I don't need to actually have pots all the way to, to, you know, every side. Right. Um, and then I, this material material here is called cattle panel and it's yeah. right now it's pretty expensive, but it's like 50 bucks for uh, a full panel, which is four feet by 16 feet. So you can do a lot with one. Um, yeah, we used to make cages out of those for plants outdoor. Yep. And you, you could make do greenhouses out of them. Yep. Yeah. And I thought about um, actually putting it on, on a side to make a, like a grid to hang equipment on um, just zip idea. tying it to the poles. Uh, but I haven't done heavy. that yet and I haven't really needed to, but for holding fans, that would be a great solution. Oh, um, good, yeah. So I've got that. And then these are just, um, these are, uh, they're Some concrete bar. casts uh, like, um, I'm sorry, they're planter um corners oh, so you can put okay. like two by four boards in there so i might reuse them later if i ever get around to it but they just lift up my system um i like it and then it drains to another expensive bit of kit and that's 
you know, that's this pump, um, basically which drains like down to like, pump. what's that? It works. looks like it works basically like a condensate pump does. Yeah, yeah. you could go cheaper. I mean, this uh, handles a higher volume and I've got multiple tents feeding into that one, that oh, one okay. bucket. That makes so, sense. and they're all at the same, they all drip at the same time. So I just wanted, you know, I spent like, I want to say it's like 130 is kind of like the cheapest. Um, yeah, I know last week you guys were talking about uh, those pumps and yeah, you can get a condensate pump at an HVAC store, um, but it's not going to handle the volume that this will. Um, so, you know, it's what you're willing to risk, I guess. It looks um, good. And I think the doc was saying that that's one of those things that you actually didn't want to cheap out on is the pump, especially because how often it's used and how vital it kind of is to your system. It looks sure. like we're getting a watering event right now. Um, yeah, many, we are. How many times a day do you uh, fertigate currently? So every two hours. So, so that's 12. 12 times a day. Pretty cool. Definitely yeah. see the influence from uh cook over cannabis a little bit on this grow here for sure. Uh, very cool. I yeah, no, I'm really fertigation action going on there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm really grateful to Doc because I struggled with cocoa. I was competent with pro mix and soil before that, but I struggled with cocoa and I, I was really frustrated by it until I found CFC. So that's been uh, really great for me. And um, so that's kind of, that's most of the setup in here. It's pretty simple. I have, um, uh, let's see. What is the plant? Okay. What are you growing there? What, what's, what are you? I'll get to that in one second. Okay, sorry. One minute. So I've got another piece of cattle panel up here to create a grid for fans. Uh, that's where I have, and also my light, because I wanted to hang my light right at the top of the tent during the last row. Um, and I'm just sort of keeping it there right now. Um, and then uh, my exhaust fan uh, pulls out of the top of the tent, and then the fan itself is on the outside of the tent. Um, so then right here, I've got, these are clones from mother plants. Um, these are Icy Grape F4. And I got Icy Grape F1 from Copa Genetics, and that's um, 96 Black Domina times Ethos Purple Skittles. And, um, and so I've just been selectively crossing that, inbreeding it, line breeding it for, you know, four generations now. And um, I, am, I am hunting through this um, sort of trying to find, um, you know, sort of, uh, a high performing female and, uh, as well as looking for, um, I, so in this line, I've seen, um, hermaphrodism, but only in male plants. So I'm sort of trying to prove that out and see if that actually, actually stays consistent. I haven't looked at that many plants. So with a small sample size, you know, I've seen this happen only in male plants, but I'm looking to see if it holds up. Um, and yeah, I'm just looking for. Um, You're not using those males though when you continue the line, are you? Or are you, use, or you are? So I, I am, but selectively. So I'm tracking which males pollinate which females. What you follow what I'm saying? What traits have you been looking for? Because you got it at F1. By the time F4 rolls around, you've had quite the influence on it. I'm just at F3 now with Develop Punch, and I've seen F1, F3. I've had a little bit of a hand in selection. Is there mm. specific smells or growth characteristics or anything like that that you're selecting for or just kind of learning as you go? Yeah, it's a specific smell. And to me, it's like orange starburst is what I get. Um, but I you know, I hand it to someone else and they smell something totally different. I, I don't know if I can trust my nose anymore, but I trust it to smell consistently for me. Um, That's what so, matters. If you're going to be the one yeah. smoking it and enjoying it. I mean, if, if you like that orange starburst smell and somebody else thinks it smells like grape starburst or fucking chocolate or whatever the hell it is, like, uh, you know, you everybody's going to experience yeah. it differently no matter what. Yeah. yeah. Hey, there's that. And then, you know, it does... Um, some of the plants will purple really, really early and really deeply. And that's nice. You know, it, it looks nice. It doesn't do much for me, but I've been, you know, trying to propagate that, trying to pull that through, but mainly the smell and also the speed of finish. That's um, funny. It might not do much for you, but I was just at a shop the other day and uh, a gentleman in there was like, I just want something purple. Show me your purple stuff. I only want purple. He's like, 
He didn't ask about strains, didn't ask Indica Sativa. He said, no. I just want something purple. Yeah, no, no. So um, you'll notice I've, I've put a lot of clones in one pot, um, <laughs> uh, which I wouldn't normally do, but I'm really just, I'm about to flip these to flower pretty soon and I'll let them stretch out and um, just get a sampling of, of what they're like. Uh, and I have much bigger, sorry about that. I have much bigger uh, mother plants that I can then um, clone again, uh, to make healthier plants or just, um, you understand. I don't need to elaborate on that. Um, yeah. And so then this is a tester that I'm running. I just um, wonder if you're going to get a good, a good read on their expression since they're going to be growing in, in a competitive environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wonder if that'll the, have any notable effect on, on the phenos that you get out of that one pot. Yeah, I'm not, that occurred to me too. I realized that the way that I grow, um, or the way that I've grown this line in particular in yeah. really cramped, confined spaces has stressed them out. And so the way, you know, I'm just going to keep doing it like that. So if it works, if they express, you know, if they're root stressed and they express a certain way and I just keep continuing to root stress them, I guess it's okay. I, I don't, you know, I agree with you. Depends on if you're um, looking to to do genetic selection based on the underlying genetics, or if you're just looking for how they respond in different environments. I think it might it might obscure the underlying genetic markers that you'd be looking for, it, it, mm. if that makes sense. I think so, but uh, yeah, but I, I don't I think know. So. I mean, it's interesting. Um, it generally has an effect on the development of the plants when they're grown in close competition like that, when the roots get tangled. Um, yep. but we'll, we'll, you know, I, I think a lot of what you're doing here sounds like you're just experimenting with different things. So it'll be really interesting to see how those turn out. Previously, I've um, kept things in individual containers. And let's just say without elaborating too much in the state that I'm in, I might be plant count limited. And this might be a way to get past a cursory look. Um, that's one plant then what you're saying in that, yep, in that, that container that's plant. only one plant over there that is one plant exactly that's i it. hear you loud and clear okay <laughs> yep what are they gonna do tear apart the root ball and get that <laughs> that's point exactly there? it they that's are essentially exactly all it. one plant you could say i topped it and then i buried it before i did I a subterranean it. topping yep what's the definition of plant technically clones uh, are you know the same plant as their mother um anyway so this is a tester that I'm that I'm growing uh, again, actually, coincidentally for Copa Genetics, um, and so I can't say what it is. I promise not to divulge it, uh, but it's something that he's really excited about. Um, I started with three seeds, and they're, they were all doing really well, but uh, it took a long while to determine sex. This plant is female. Uh, we'll see if it uh, if it herms. Hopefully, it doesn't. Um, but this one tonight, I, I'm pretty sure that those are pollen sacks. So I'm calling it and I'm going in I'm with you. right That's now. I've got my shears. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, it's the execution. It out. It's the execution. Yep. Oh my gosh. Live execution. So we just on had a live execution. Oh, wow. This, this just became 18 know. and up. Live oh, no, we, we may have had to do a trigger warning on before YouTube. that, man. <laughs> yeah. So violent. So it was. <laughs> it was. Oh, gosh. I'm reeling. So, um, yeah. So I'm going to flip these to flower as soon as I can. I want this plant to be flowering already. Uh, and these I want to give a little more time. So, you know, I'm sort of balancing those two, uh, those two desires. But... Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much what I've got going on. Well, now that now that she's got a little more room in her pot, maybe uh, bend her over, spread her out a little bit, give her some time, and uh, maybe let her yeah. take up half the tent, and then the other two take up the other half. Yeah, that, that room just got you. Just got a lot more room all of a sudden, man. That's cool. Yeah, more well, airflow. Oh, uh, the chat loves the live execution, man. They're they're really yes. enjoying that. <laughs> Everyone's yeah, going wild. Just, yeah, yeah, everybody, that, everybody that got their attention for sure. <laughs> As a student of history, I know that it does pretty well for large crowds of people. So <laughs> red and circuses incorporating that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. More um, live executions. Is that what the cheap home girl is calling doing for? The thumbs, guys. It sounds like it to me. 
I got it. Uh, so my plan no. we're gonna to hit some this- weird sensor issue guys with this episode i'm worried about it now that's probably true actually yeah <laughs> So I'm in the Northeast somewhere and um, it's super, super humid and it's expensive to dehumidify. And, uh, and I've sealed my grow room for smell. So I'm trying to keep my uh, actual biomass as low as possible. So I'm, I, I get what you're saying about spreading it out, but the light electricity is probably, the wasted electricity on my light is probably cheaper than just dehumidifying the extra transpiration of really building a big canopy. So I'm probably just going to keep this small, um, as small as possible. And that's why I wanted to flip it to flower uh, like yesterday, but it is what it is. Well, and they go crazy in cocoa with high frequency fertigation. Once you flip it yeah, to flower, do. it just like takes off and becomes like two or three times the size. Yeah. 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 He's watering every two hours. That plant's going to grow huge in the next few weeks. Yep. So you guys last week, you were talking about um, like your the purchases you regret the most, but also like the things that you, you really are glad that you, that you bought. And Do you have a regret or something you're glad about? No, I have something I'm, I'm glad about. I'm sure I, I have plenty of regrets, Doc, but um, <laughs> one thing I, I, I'm really glad that I to have on hand is like an extra critical component, whatever that is. If it's a small $12 pump or a $16 timer, I want an extra one of those so that when something goes down, I've got a backup. It, or even just a backup plan, like a backup light, even if it's not, um, not optimal, you know, if a ballast goes, I've got something just to keep my plants alive uh, until I get a replacement, a proper replacement. So that's all, all I wanted to say. I think that's good advice. Uh, have a, some redundancy, I guess. Like my exhaust fan just broke. Uh, it didn't like completely stopped functioning but it got super loud and it was less effective so it was like really annoying and making like some wow wow kind of noise going on where it was silent yep. before and it's silent now which is nice again just got a new one but um that re- that reminds me of my biggest regret and um i didn't know that it was actually a common thing i thought i was the only one who nearly had their house burnt down by a, a, a an oscillating fan um i didn't know why it broke and now I know, and that makes sense to me. But um, yeah, I uh, I really regret buying one, even though I didn't, you know, lose anything except the fan and twenty five dollars. Uh, yeah, so thank you for letting me know. I might have replaced it at some point, thinking that I just got a bad one. But so let's turn this into a learning experience. What uh, what did you do wrong? If you're com- comfortable with saying, yeah, well, so. As you guys pointed out, if you've got it in the normal fan position, which is like, you know, right over here clamped onto a pole, um, and then the sides suck in, they're putting tension on the pinion gear that makes the thing move. Um, They're putting pressure on the pinion gear, which makes the fan oscillate and it starts to strip. In my case, um, like if we're looking at this one, so there's, um, it's just direct drive. And so the, the shaft that comes through and the impeller, that was just like basically wobbling like this in my unit by the time it was, uh, it was done. And it was like smoking. It was awful. Um, so I don't know if, the, if that's exactly what happened. Um, like I, don't, I don't know if the oscillation mechanism broke, but uh, I believe that, uh, that that's what happened. I think the lights actually wear on the cheap plastic too, because like even my clip on fans after like a, a couple of years, when I go to like squeeze the clip to like move it up and down, sometimes it'll just like bust into a bunch of small, tiny pieces of plastic. And I can actually keep that. What you were talking about earlier, redundancy and backup. I have at least one six inch white clip on fan just sitting unopened in a box for as soon as one of mine dies or breaks, because even as much as I try and clean them run to run, those things always end up being my first failure point. So I just, a brand new one inbox for whenever that does happen. Mm. Mm-hmm. I do the same thing with, you know, carbon filters. Like if the carbon filter is the thing that's going to get me found out, even though I'm legal, I don't want people knowing that I'm growing people kick in, you know, <laughs> people kick in doors for phones and laptops. I definitely don't want people knowing that, uh, that I've got cannabis. So, or yeah, what my- if like, who knows what if there's like an event that happens and like, Suddenly somebody's at your door asking if they can come in because something has happened and 
<laughs> you don't want to be like, no, no, please don't come in. <laughs> you can't come in. You know, you want to be uh, thinking about continuing. Keep training. the door closed and be like, well, you, you got a fucking warrant. That's what you want to say. <laughs> <laughs> <In> my brain. <laughs> Some people That's are doing no knock warrants. If you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. coming in unannounced and kicking that fucking door down if they smell it unfortunately and that's why i said i think last week my favorite thing was carbon filter and like silencer because you can't have enough security in my opinion I, like i in college lived with a few roommates and we had basically we were targeted for laptops and cell phones somebody broke into my home with a gun and it's not a fun situation to be on the receiving end of so like you said people will do that also for cannabis unfortunately i still see news articles and, and videos on youtube of uh cannabis shops getting broken into by armed robbers and people that distribute it getting robbed and killed for it unfortunately even small amounts like sub 100 amounts as so, yeah there was a story yeah. recently that came out i think it was here close to san diego actually where that happened so yeah it's tragic no one should die over this plant and no one should be imprisoned over it obviously and i think most of us Definitely. can agree to that but unfortunately they're, they're, both those things happen also a good buddy of mine uh his uh he has a, a medical card and grow 15 plants and him and his uh, kid's mom broke up. And then she was putting it all over Facebook that his house was a marijuana factory, brought it up in court. So yeah, I would suggest stealth at all costs. Always. I don't care what anybody says. Go for it. Red flag. Oh. No, it's terrible. Cool. Well, thank you. Keystone cops for, for coming on and, uh, showing us and talking to us about what you're up to thank you for having me oh, i'm gonna shit. that was great thank you i'm gonna leave the chat now and go right, back man. to the thank youtube you. stream thanks, thanks. Girl, man that's awesome oh, yeah. a lot of people do yeah, yeah, stick around if you want to it's a nice it's concise a, system honestly thank you thank you i actually i'm going to um i already bought another set of these blocks um i'm actually just waiting until dark to bring them into my house because it's like, why are you bringing planter blocks into your house? Again, just OPSEC. Um, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm going to elevate this a little bit more. You guys were talking about like the value of a couple extra inches last week uh, in terms of height. But I'm, uh, I want to raise this up so that I can do a better job um, ducting into this because sometimes it doesn't pump out properly. It, it, the level gets too high and it, it's been flooding out and it's been intermittent. And luckily the catch basin that comes with AC infinity tents has um, it's always worked and I haven't had any like bigger spills, but I just want to get a little more height on that. Um, and that'll also let me get a good drain back from, from the feed lines back into um, the reservoir. Because uh, right now it's sort of so-so as to whether or not it's gravity feeding back. It's so kind I of level. The lines, the lines drop after they're going out of the tent or there. Like the the emitters are higher than the line. So you have a there's a siphon on that line, right? So, like you don't you haven't broken the siphon from the the reservoir. Right. Right. So then the reservoir level is always sitting lower than the, the heads of those emitters? Yes. And that, that actually um, leads me to a question. So you recommend uh, like a blue plastic poly drum, yeah. uh, like a tall sort of tall format. And I, I was curious about why you, why you picked that format because I'm using um, like Sterilite totes, which are really inexpensive at any big box store um so like a 27 gallon tote which is gives you more volume at a lower height yeah you know it, it's a trade-off it depends on how much because that that's a 14 gallon tub but i never fill it up to 14 gallons i can only fill it up to about seven or eight gallons but i always do a fountain style irrigation where i'm pumping water up above the the top and letting it fall back down and that requires mm -hmm. a few extra inches at least you know off the top of the reservoir um so i i agree there's other sort of reservoirs that you can get that that hold it lower you know you got to think about the aeration involved there and you know if you're doing it with a water pump like that then 
you may need a couple of them or think about maybe, you know, pumping it over the top and having it drop back on the other side or something just so it, that the whole reservoir is getting well mixed. Oh, that makes sense. So it's an aeration issue. That makes a lot of sense to me. I'm using an airstone, um, okay. which I have issues with. So yeah, airstones that's are a whole other thing. They, they grow stuff. <laughs> like Yeah, I, I would rapidly. feel ashamed. I, I'm not showing mine because it's actually my, my secret shame. Um, <laughs> It's yeah. disgusting right now. So, you know, I, I really kind of think that it, a water pump, um, that just a tiny little water pump that runs intermittently and for a few seconds or like a minute before each one of your events, if you're doing an event every two hours, you could just have a, a small pump that's in the tank that comes on for like a minute before that event, pumps the water up and let it drop back down and do your aeration that way um that should be fine you could eliminate the the air pump um if you went with a sort of water pump like that um if your tote so it you know accommodates that the the other thing there is if you are using an air stone try to get cold air um yep. It's the pumping the room temperature air through the water heats it up. It becomes really hard to sort of keep a good air or water temperature. And it, it's almost that water temperature issue that, um, you know, getting up above 70, they, they creates the, the bacteria growth in your reservoir. Um, so if at all possible, right, get, get colder. And I'm sure you probably know this. Yeah, I'm thinking that through as you're as you're describing it. And I think what I'm going to need to do is is come up with some sort of tower pump, some system where I pump water up and it falls down a baffle or something like that that's managed that can that can rise up above the tote that I have um, because I can't really get cooler air. Uh, even if I locate the pump outside, like if I locate it down in my basement and pump up, well, then I'm, I'm going to get condensate in the line and it's going to kill the pump quite quickly. So, um, yeah. I, I really don't, I, I no, it would just be like putting it in front of the air conditioner if you had one, but I, I agree. Um, it, it is, I, I think that that's the biggest issue is the fact that you're pumping relatively warm air through the water and it's that relatively warm air warms up the water and just creates a, a good breeding ground for bacteria. Um, yep. You can keep it a little bit cooler. Now, the thing that people do that's a mistake with the water pump is they run the water pump too much and then the water pump itself heats up the water, right? Because mm. it's a little motor in there. So you don't want to run the water pump constantly um, if it's sitting in the reservoir. Um, but, you know, running it for a minute or two before your irrigation events won't be a problem. Great. That's great to know. Yeah, I, was, I, I knew that you advised running it intermittently, just running it yeah. like for within the 15 minutes before a fertigation event. I, I thought that was just about being frugal and that didn't make sense to me since it's like an eight watt pump. But uh, what you're saying makes sense to me about the heat. That makes yeah, a lot of sense. Yeah, that, that's about the heat, right? Because if you just have that little pump going in there constantly, which you could, right? It's not going to be a big power draw, <laughs> but it's just going to gradually warm up that water. Um, and yeah, it, a couple of minutes before the event is really enough, right? And it's not long enough to, to bother heating the, the reservoir. Um, Rowdy is sort of on this topic in the chat right now. I see that he's saying this res does, stays at uh, 71 F. Ah, it's, you're going to start to have probably, it would be better at 69 F, Rowdy is what I could say. Um, 68 is really your sweet spot. As soon as you break over the 70 degree Fahrenheit sort of threshold, it, it becomes a much more hospitable environment for anaerobic bacteria, largely because that at that water temperature, um, the, the water's ability to hold dissolved oxygen starts to really drop. Um, so keeping it down in the high 60s, the water has a much higher um, oxygen holding capacity at that temperature. 71 is not terrible, though. I mean, people running at 78 because their room is 78 and they're pumping that room air through their res. And that's where you get, you know, bacteria growing very quickly. And your reservoir smells like a, an old fish tank that somebody needs to clean out.
Yeah, and just to put my IPM hat on, like uh, some of those pathogens, we've talked about it a few times, and I think it really bears repeating, but like your pythiums, yeah. you know, water molds and things like that. Uh, some mm -hmm. of the really scary ones that affect tons of plants out there, uh, you know, the kind of just ubiquitous in the environment. And um, the real the real game is to not make us uh, a circumstance where they can easily germinate and sort of proliferate. And you're already kind of winning the battle that way, for sure. I think if you're struggling with a little bit more, not crazy, like 71, which isn't the greatest, I think your best bet is to go sterile and, and look for some kind of uh, you know an addition there that's going to help you <laughs> avoid those problems become before yeah. they become a problem for sure I, I haven't seen rowdy's question because i'm only in zoom but um i'm running a sterile reservoir or i'm trying to i add 60 milliliters of h2o2 and that's 31 percent strength and uh that's in a 25 gallon reservoir and that's not keeping it sterile. I mean, it, right. it's not bad, but it's um, with the issues I'm having. It's it, I still what's get a little bit of biofilm. I don't know. Okay. Uh, um, what's your air temp in your room? Uh, about ninety with lights on. In the room where the reservoir is sitting. Um. Let's see. No, it's eighty in the room with 80. the reservoir. So your, yeah, your, your, your water is probably going to be in the, the high 70s, at least, if you're pumping that air through it. So um, I, I do think the the uh, water pump instead of an air pump will help. It's not going to totally resolve it, though, right? Because like having a reservoir, right. like sitting in the room, eventually it's going to heat up to the same temperature as the room is. Um, you know, the DIY hack for this is just to freeze frozen water bottles and, you know, rotate frozen water bottles and let them float in your reservoir tank. Um, it's kind of a pain in the butt, but it really will help. And at a certain point, I, I think a lot of growers that are faced with this problem have to ask themselves, is cleaning the reservoir out every five days a bigger pain in the butt than like rotating the frozen water bottles twice a day? Um, if you can keep the, the water temperature below 70, anybody that's running a, a reservoir now that's above 70, if you can get the water temperature below 70, it, it, you'll, you'll be like dancing. You'll be giddy because it's like so much cleaner and mm. you can go so much longer before you have to like drain it all and clean everything and soak it all and all the rest of that. Um, so there's, there's a big benefit to, to try to get on the, the other side of that. 70 degree threshold there a lot of different ways you can try to run sterile as well with uh you can try chlorine you can try there's a lot of different products out there there's also some natural products if you want to try to stay natural you can try to just embrace it and go with like an em1 product or a lactobacillus product something like that i tried hydroguard and it didn't really make any difference hydro didn't yeah. do shit for you huh yeah well it, it was no different than than using um peroxide. uh peroxide Hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, it, it's tough. In a warm, nutrient-laden water, it's just such an ideal environment for bacteria to grow. It, it's it's tough to. I mean, I use a bunch of hydrogen peroxide too, but it, it doesn't um, obviate the need. And the other side of this is, you know, dissolved oxygen. This came up before um, in a previous show, but dissolved oxygen is important not just to maintain sort of the reservoir and to keep the, the anaerobic bacteria down, but it, it's important for the plants themselves. If you're in a high frequency fertigation system in particular, um, a lot of the oxygen that the plants are getting is the dissolved oxygen in the water. Um, so getting them more dissolved oxygen um, will lead to sort of better growth for your plants, irrespective of all the issues of, of bacteria. I that's love, that's great advice I'm, I'm fortunate that most of my year other than the warmest part of the summer out of my tap I, i'm not sure if a laser temp gun is perfect for water coming out of a tap but even like when it's in my watering can it comes out at 68 degrees if i just use the cold faucet like on the dot 68 degrees for like 300 days of the year there's like 60 days where it pushes up into like the mid to low 70s but i feel very lucky to 
just be able to have that come straight out of the tap. And um, it's not full of super high PPM of other stuff. There may be a little chlorine or chloramine, but that's easy enough to take care of. Um, I will say that my reservoir and pump system is so inexpensive. I actually have a backup. And so what I'll do when it's time to do a, a res cleaning, which I do every nine days normally. And because it's really hot right now and it's getting to be summer, I have to do it more frequently, I think. Yeah. But I can sort of mix up a new batch of solution, you know, move out the old reservoir system, just put in the new one, the replacement one throw the pump and the air stone in a bucket with some diluted uh, H2O2 and just wait until I've got time to deal with it. But you're, you're right. I've still got to clean it out, but, yeah. but maybe that's not the worst thing either. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm still, but your point about the dissolved oxygen is, is taken. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm internalizing that and uh, thinking about why that, how that might be hampering growth that I could otherwise be making. It's yeah. tough because you can't see it, but it's one of those things that yeah. like, it does matter. Water is water, right? You look at it, it looks like water, but when it's 68 versus 78, there's a massive difference in how it can impact uh, the soil or the cocoa or whatever and yep. the plant ultimately. I'm going to make the other point here too, just sensitive to like sort of the cheap home grow side of this is plants can survive as I'm sure Keystone cops can tell you there can be some bacteria in his reservoir and he's still feeding his plants and they're still fine. I mean, the plants can survive that bacteria in the reservoir. I know a lot of growers like freak out when they first put a automatic watering system and they realize that, you know, there's some bacteria forming in their reservoir because it smells um, and that they're going to like kill their plants. Um, particularly the way Keystone is growing it with high frequency fertigation in, in cocoa, he's going to have really healthy roots and they're going to be pretty impervious to the, the infection possibilities from that. Um, but so you don't have to like avoid it altogether. I'm not saying that right. Um, on the other side, there are definitely advantages to keeping your water cooler. Um, and since you got to be working on one thing or the other, right, since you're either going to be doing sort of more frequent or deeper sort of tank and equipment clean outs or doing something like like rotating through water bottles um you know you just have to figure out which form of work sort of suits better for you getting an actual chiller um thinking about sort of the equipment for this uh chillers are pretty expensive um but you can get a small chiller for a few hundred dollars like 250 300 somewhere in that neighborhood um you know, if you want to actually sort of upgrade to the equipment to take care of this problem for you, but um, short of that, yeah, you know, the DIY hack, just freeze some water bottles. That's, I, I want to add one thing to what you're saying though. So yes. I have killed or nearly killed plants due to biofilm buildup and it okay. wasn't with this exact setup. The, and this is just a caution, you know this, but just to caution other, uh, other growers, these are, uh, watering halos um, with a half inch line. When I was using, or anytime I've used quarter inch lines with tiny little emitters like this, uh, I have gotten emitters that got stuck. And I was wondering, I was thinking my balance was off mm -hmm. and it was biofilm blocking them up. So um, look out for that. But you'll see your plant will, you'll get plenty of warning before you actually kill a plant that way. Yeah. Not, so you killed it just by cutting off its water supply, right? It, the emitter yeah, got I didn't. Blocked. I didn't really kill it, but it, you know, they started yeah. to die. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but it wasn't the bacteria directly <laughs> sort of infecting the plant. It was the bacteria like creating a dam that kept the water from going to the plant. That's like a exactly high cholesterol it. situation. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly yeah. it. And I just moved away from those smaller emitters because they're just not worth the trouble. But if I fix the biofilm issue, I, I'm, I'll be free to move back to whatever emitters I want to use. Is your water wet? Uh, you know, sometimes I, I put a little pinch of yucca in. sometimes I don't, I, I go back and forth on it. I don't see a difference. I I've heard you can the see emitters, the water. It's one of the issues of the emitters. Your emitters are less likely to clog if your water's wet. Yeah. And I, I'm sure there's a bunch of people like that was the stupidest question I've ever heard somebody ask out loud, but like, you know, the wetness of water, the, the, whether you're using a surfactant, um, to lower the surface tension of the water. Um, the, the lower surface tension, it actually 
helps things stay dissolved better um, and it helps the water sort of squeeze through tight spaces better. Um, in With your halos in that size pot, right, that we're looking at there, like you don't need to be sort of concerned about the lateral distribution of water, but wetting agents also help the lateral distribution of water through a media um, you know, if you don't, if you only have one or two points of emission and making sure that all of the media gets wet. Mm -hmm. We got a good question from Pet G. They ask at Spartan Grown, I'm running water soluble calcium through my 20 gallon outdoor pots, very high DLI, Caribbean sun. They are huge pre flowering. Will the cow at, it says antagonize, but I think it may be antagonized is what they're ready. Yeah. And it, it's very possible. I mean, it's, it's a danger and calcium is a big one that has antagonists to a lot of different ones, but there's a lot of one, a lot of big ones like phosphorus and, and, and potassium, for example, magnesium too, the one that'll pop up. So it's a hard question to answer because I don't know what those levels are in, in, in your soil. And um, I don't know the level of calcium that you're feeding. So there's a lot of, I don't knows, but Long story short, I would expect to eventually run into an issue if you keep adding calcium with nothing else. Yeah, I basically agree with that. I think that if your dose of calcium is is too high, you're most likely to suffer magnesium deficiencies and lockouts. Jack showing us the the. Mulder's chart here, and we'll see the line between uh, calcium. Where's calcium? Oh, that's up at the top. Right at the top. And magnesium are antagonistic. Calcium is also antagonistic with uh, phosphate and yeah, um, potassium. Oh, zinc. I didn't know that. Zinc too. Boron. I didn't know that one either. Magnesium. Lots of connections. This is an interesting chart. I always like to bring it up whenever these conversations come about because there are more connections than people sometimes account for. And um, yeah, there are antagonism and, and synergism, as you see with the red arrows. Basically, for those who have never seen this chart before, you've got calcium here. If it antagonizes something, like I've got a red arrow going down to zinc and I've got a red arrow going to manganese and to uh, potash, but it's going both ways, right? So potash is also antagonizing uh calcium and, and vice versa with manganese yeah. but so i got an interesting that, there's different kinds the, of relationships the, that cause those antagonisms yeah. um, i was gonna say they can't all be if it was all it has to be excess of certain ones that antagonize right not just it being in the that's substrate the shows. yeah, yeah. That's a, that's yeah. What the ratios yeah that's what the agnetism arrow means in my head is this is what I use this chart for is when I see what I think is a deficiency, I first go to this chart and I'll be like, <laughs> all right, is this just an antagonism from another part problem? So if I think it's a deficiency of calcium is a terrible example, because it's got so many other antagonists, but if it was something with less antagonists, like nitrogen, maybe for example, if I thought it was a nitrogen deficiency, I could look at this chart and say, is it nitrogen or do I have an overabundance of copper and boron and, uh, potash and so potassium so that i could think oh yeah i did top dress a bunch of potassium maybe that's what my issue is it's not that i don't have as much nitrogen as i put so much potassium in that they can't even use the nitrogen that's what it's i see more a... often is people giving too much of one thing and it blocks out another thing it could just yeah, be a general yeah. the ec is too high and you get them that... back down into an ec range that's appropriate they have the appropriate ner it's just that they were giving way too much of it which led to locking something out Right, like magnesium is considered a calcium mimic or mimic, or calcium could be considered a, a magnesium mimic. Um, they're taken up through the, the same processes by the plants in, in like identical ways, they have the same charge. Um, the plant doesn't really distinguish between them. So if you have an overabundance of calcium, um, the plant is just going to end up taking up less magnesium because every time it tries to take up something like that, it, it's going to be taking up a calcium, calcium every single time. So that's why it's really important to have things like calcium and magnesium in the right balance to each other because it's that, that ratio really determines what gets uptaken. Um, so you can block magnesium uptake just by having an overabundance of calcium.
Uh, Brian, 4.20 p.m. says, how does sulfur play in those reactions? Sulfur is getting really popular. And I don't know if I saw it on the list. It wasn't on that one. Sulfur is real popular for terpene production. That's why it's really popular in cultivation right now, in my opinion. Plus, it's one that's um, difficult to really get one of these um, reactions with, and it doesn't really antagonize, I don't believe, with a lot of things. And, and at the level, you can get pretty high in levels before it's like a, a toxic level in cannabis. It can accept a decent amount of sulfur. So I think that's why, for all those reasons, is why sulfur is pretty popular right now. Plus all the bugs it kills and fungi and oh other God. things too. How if did you're I not bring that up. How did I? Not yeah. Bring... Thank you, Matthew. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is a it is a very necessary element in the uh, nutrient take up department too. I'll put a link into the uh, chat on YouTube of an article I have that basically says it's vital, like the beginning of everything, pretty much. Yeah, and I forget actually your um your cutout tile actually. No, I, I was done. Yeah, I'm just going to put that link in chat to the article that uh, talks of the importance of sulfur is what I was getting at. I just oh, found okay. a, a research paper that says sulfur deficiency in plants. Uh, okay, but antagonism between potassium, magnesium, and calcium, according to this NAIH.gov article. Yeah, and I forget what the, like the bio, like what the physiological what those processes are that that's important too, but there are a lot of things, I suppose. Um, they just don't come to my mind specifically. I think I was, well, and we also know that, um, you know, there are a bunch of uh, volatiles that are sulfur based too, right? Um, that came out like last year or this year. Interesting uh, research report regarding that. All right, guys, I'm going to have to dip here. It's getting close to my time where I have to let these boneheaded dogs. Did you see my dog come busting through the door? He just busted through with his head. It scared the shit out of me. Anyhow. <laughs> Anyways, uh, it was nice hanging with you guys. It was awesome talking. This was a great uh, a great show. I really enjoyed this with especially Keystone. Shout out to you, man, for coming up and showing your grow. And uh, it was good to meet you. Thank you. And Spartan, um, thank you. And yeah, no problem. And uh, everyone, uh, everyone in chat, you know, we do this show for you guys, and it's great to see the same faces pop up. You, you know, and it's cool to see new faces, but it, I, I'd rather see. I, I really do like to see the faces that I've been seeing all these years pop up. It's just cool to see. It's like a big family. But I'm out of here, guys. You, you can see me in uh, I don't know 15 minutes on the Michigan Rose Grow Show, and uh, I hope you all are out there growing some fucking dank weed, and uh, everybody keeps growing. Grows love. Peace out. Peace out, Spartan. Grow love, Spartan. I totally noticed when his dog busted in. I, I wrote a DM to him. And I was like, oh, good boy has entered the room. <laughs> I saw a door fly open. You could see the little tail. It's a, it like more pit bull looking dog. But yeah, good, great dude. Always happy to have him. And uh, we've got a few minutes left. I just saw a question in the chat. Scroll by Franklin Guerrero says, when y'all say yucca, y'all mean that starchy root in the produce section at Cocoa for Cannabis? <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Um, yucca powder. It's it's the dried root of a yucca been ground up into a powder. Um, yeah, that's what we're talking about. You use tiny, tiny amounts of it, like a pinch. Um, an eighth of a teaspoon is enough for five to 10 gallons of water. Um, so tiny amounts of it and it's full of saponins and it acts as a very effective wetting agent. Um, yucca also has some other properties. It, it helps plants become a little bit, uh, more resistant to temperature swings and other things like that. Not good for fish though. Horrible for fish. It's because yeah, it's no, such it's a good not... wetting agent. It makes them basically drown, right? They can't get oxygen out of the water or something. It messes with their I thought it was deals. toxic. Oh, it could be just toxic. I think the saponids are toxic to fish. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that makes more sense then. Um, yeah, so not for our aquaponics friends out there. Um, I will say the one fresh thing that you would get, not yucca at the grocery store, if you're going to use it, that you hear about is, is aloe. People love to clone with aloe. You can get those giant, like here in California, especially like the size of my arm, barb. I think it's called a barb, right? Uh, whatever the 
leaf of an aloe shoot is, but they sell them at the grocery store and you can chop that and then take your clones and stick it right into the aloe fresh and pull it out and stick that in a rooter. And it does a pretty good job of making a clones root in my experience. So that's a nice one to find fresh. Yeah. 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 And the yucca, I want to shout out a, a sort of tip, a hack that Smart Poker and Crispy Wannabe uh, brought to my attention, which is, if you get one of those, if somebody said the, the raw yucca packs and yeah, raw yucca is good yucca, but get, put it in some steel jar. Um, if you're in any kind of humidity, the yucca will eventually turn to little, like little rocks inside that bag. Um, you know, get a two ounce or whatever the smallest thing is, because again, an eighth of a teaspoon makes five to 10 gallons and then put it in some sort of sealed jar so that it, it's protected from the humidity and it'll stay fresh longer. Um, because you'll have that four ounces of stuff around for quite a while, unless you're a pretty big grower. That or overdosing on the yucca, giving too much, getting that water super wet, or just overkilling it. In well, all you know, that actually acts like a flush. If you put way too much yucca into your water, um, it'll hinder the uptake of all nutrition and essentially act like, like flush water. Um, there's no other real risk of overdosing with the yucca, but yeah, you don't want to do that. A little bit goes a long way and you only need a little bit. It's a pertinent tip. It's good not to be a more on gardener or more on gardener, just given more of it, whatever it is, nutrients, yucca. Uh, sometimes people feel like my plant's not growing fast enough. If I just give it more, it'll go faster. And it's like, not always the case, usually actually the opposite, uh, tending, especially with like water. Generally, I see people, they're like new gardeners want to water the plant every single day. Um, in cocoa, that works. It, you can do it 12 times a day. But if you're in soil and you're watering it every single day and it hasn't had any dry back, uh, you can overwater and get root rot and a, bunch, a whole bunch of other issues. So good to kind of learn to read the plant and not just throw more onto it just because it feels good to do. You don't always have to be doing something. But there's a way to set up if you feel like you have to always want to do something. Cocoa, you can water. I think somebody else was doing like, I think 20 plus times a day, maybe 40 times a day. Uh, Doc, you probably remember. Who was it? Maybe it was Smart Poker who came on who said they were doing like. Smart Poker was doing like 16 or something. Um, yeah, that's pushing it. I mean, I think that's enough, by the way. <laughs> 12, 16, you're, you're right on on track there you do like not, five right or six or something? i do five or six sometimes i'll do more than that in smaller containers um but yeah ideally you're watering again when five percent or less of the container volume of water so it, it to get adequate runoff um and you know you can do it more frequently than that so that your amounts are even smaller than that but that's like in a in a five gallon container, if it's actually five gallons in your five gallon container, we wanna be watering less than a quart of water to get runoff. Um, and I usually grow in smaller containers, so it's even smaller than that in terms of the amount of water that, that we're providing at each event. Um, that, that's about the, the limit, 5% of your container volume. If you're watering more than that, I, I recommend in cocoa under high frequency fertigation to increase your frequency good strategy we've got noah the grower over here in his room and it is looking absolutely fire it honestly kind of looks like before you switched to the organics i feel like you've got it dialed in now to, to the point it's hard for me to tell the difference from before it's pretty filled out full of chunky good looking buds but you're on mute noah so go ahead and tell us what we're looking at or maybe do you just keep showing us around uh yeah uh these are some new ones i just put in right here this is a uh, an overflow g this is gelato do -si -do cross. This is a blue that I get to see it's pretty yellow. I'm getting ready to take that down. This is another gelato. This is a duct tape. That's a Skittles. That's an apple fritter. And that is a Sunday driver cross with do -si -dos. Quite a selection, man. It's looking killer. I mean, yeah. very few bare spots in those scrogs and in a lot of uh, very, very chunky, nice, dank colas. If you look at Noah's Instagram reel, you'll see those buds up close look very nice. Yeah, this one right here, it's just kind of in the back. And I had another one like that. It's like, well, that hole is there. And then it just, I, I always try and uh, pack it in as much as I can for this time of year. 
but uh yeah i try to keep uh all all the canopies full as i can for sure you're crushing it over there that uh bio 365 soil i think is what you're using right yeah bio 365 yep bio all is what i've been using i have some bio flour too but i uh i bought a bunch of the bio all and i and i love it and um yeah, I'm still still figuring it out and still learning little little tweaks here and there, you know, but yeah, I'm digging it. You're doing a really good job, man. It's uh, always cool to see somebody trying new things and not, you know, completely failing. I know a lot of people are afraid to change it up and, and try new stuff, but you don't really get to see what you love best and what works best until you've tried multiple things and even just uh, how different clones might react in different cultivation uh, mediums, you know, you might like it one way more and uh certain setup and more the other way the old way i guess at this point is what it would be but i uh definitely can't wait to come visit you up there and, and try out some of this stuff or whenever you come down here to link up anytime anytime with that said we're coming into the uh closing hours and uh i want to give our guest an opportunity to give his uh final thoughts and shout out so keystone Thank you so much for joining us and uh, where can the people find you if they are looking, if you want them to find you. So I'm most active on Instagram at Keystone Cops, uh, but I normally on the internet go by Keystone Cops. I just couldn't get that on IG. Um, and you can find me at CFC and that's where I keep pretty detailed journals. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say before, uh, before we wrap up, up, I, even though I'm following a very prescriptive growth um that doc puts out there or i'm sort of obviously emulating a lot of his stuff i've learned so much from everyone on the panel and uh i don't think you guys really understand what a service you're doing to the community i mean it's been said before but this podcast has really changed um a lot of people's abilities to grow cannabis so i just want to thank you and i'm sure that's you know that's echoed by everyone that's listening. So that's awesome, Keystone. Thank you very Damn, much. And, and grower love, man. Much grower love. And thanks for answering the call about coming on the show, too. Well, I'd love to come back once everything is uh, in late flower and show you guys where this ends up. We'd be happy Absolutely. to have you back when the time comes Thank for you. sure. That's what we, we did that with Dog Doctor, and it was super cool for the people to see, like, you know, uh, he did a topping, but you like cut out the mail. So we'll have that moment in time captured in our history of when you cut that mail out. Now that female's got that whole pot and you're about to flip it to flower soon. And we'll have the before and after kind of video, which will be awesome to see. I will say I'm humbled by the amount of people who give us that same kind of feedback that we're able to help them grow. And that's what the show is all about. I'm meeting more new growers. I'm getting new followers and following new people. My thing is if you grow cannabis and you post it, I will follow you. <laughs> like if I can, uh, once I hit that 7,500 limit on Instagram, I go on my backup account and I'll start following people. But I love to see cannabis grown. Like I don't care if you're brand new or if you've been doing it for 40 years. I love to see cannabis grown and all the different expressions and options available and the cool different people the, the you know that make this amazing community that we're all a part of. Um, it's great to interact with all of you. And that's why I'm always excited to come on these shows. I mean, the time flies. I can't believe we're already two hours in here and we've only got five minutes left. So uh, Keystone, thank you again for joining us. And uh, next up, I want to pass it to Doc for his final thoughts and shout out. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Keystone Cops. Thank you, Jack Greenstock. Hey, I, you know, we haven't mentioned this yet, but I got to meet Gre Jack Greenstock on uh, Tuesday this week. He came over, we got to smoke together and, and hang out. And, uh, I was impressed. Jack's even more impressive in person, I think, than he is in, in you know, the podcast. Yeah. So I, I hope everybody has the, the blessed experience that I had to, to get to hang out and, and smoke with Jack. Um, really enjoyed the show today, guys. I enjoyed Keystone Cops coming on the show. I enjoyed Aaron the Grower coming on and talking to us about his, his dry room and what he's got going on out there. Um, and the Tavool wood moisture meter thing, that was pretty cool too. So thank you guys for sort of all that education. We all learned something on this show. Um, I am Dr. MJ Coco. Like I said, I have a par test premiere on Tuesday evening and I'm giving away the FCE 3000 from Mars during that premiere. So 
check out my YouTube channel and join us for that one on Tuesday evening. And uh, you can find me at Coco for Cannabis on Instagram at Dr. MJ Coco and here every week on uh, the Growing with My Fellow Growers podcast. Grower love, everyone. Grow love, and thank you so much again for joining us. It was great meeting you this week in person, finally, after years of talking to each other weekly. Uh, it was cool to get to meet you in person, and I'm one of the few who actually knows what you look like now, which is uh, cool. And uh, I will advocate for cocoa because a lot of people like to like look down on synthetic nutrients on the organic side and be like, oh, if synthetic's not as good, it's not as good. Doc's cocoa grown bud is very tasty and delicious and amazing. And I definitely think that if oh, that means it's, the it's, world, Jack. it's a platitude to say this, but well-grown cannabis is well-grown cannabis. If you're doing it in DWC, if you're doing it in cocoa, if you're doing it in soil, whatever you can do to grow yourself some good cannabis, I'm a big advocate for that. And I think the show is, uh, does everything we can to help people do that as affordably as possible. But with that said, our IPM expert of the panel, Matthew Gates, thank you so much for joining us and final thoughts and shout out. It was nice to see that system, honestly, um, and I really appreciate having more people on. Uh, the chat interactions are also where I feel like the most fulfilled when we're talking about, well, basically we're answering questions for people who maybe have no access to other information. Um, it's the genesis for the Zenthanol project for my, um, for my Discord channel, which you can join if you want some IPM information quickly and easily. I'm not always accessible on Instagram and other places. I just post about that, actually. You can check me out on that YouTube channel, Xenthanol, for a bunch of pest primer videos about fungus gnats and spider mites and all kinds of other insects, especially uh, new ones coming up and beneficials and that sort of a thing. And also, you can find me on Instagram at Sync Angel and also on Twitter, which is also at Sync Angel. And I oftentimes post and repost um, heady research reports about plant physiology and uh, pathogens and how plants fight off their uh, pests and things like that. It's very interesting to me all the time. And I love it when people share with me that interest. Thank you so much for joining us and all the work that you do both here and on all the platforms that you're putting information out there for free and even the, you know, exclusive access groups that people out there that it could be as little as $1 a month to get access to something that could save your entire grow. And he has other options as well to, you know, go check out his uh, Patreon, the supporter level. So I'm a big fan of uh, Matthew Gates and all of his work that he does. And I really appreciate your time, Matthew. So thank you again for joining us. Next up, we got Noah the Rowe. Yeah, I had a great time today on topics. Um, glad uh, I was really cool to hear um, Keystone Cops talking about how the, the show has uh, helped him out. And uh, I think that's really cool. I've learned quite a bit. Um, I know that uh, other growers that I've that have turned on to the show have told me that they've been really enjoyed it. And uh, I have a blast with everybody as always. And uh, thanks for having me again. I'll see you guys all next week. See you next week. That's at Noah. V with two E's, Groa on Instagram. Check them out. Growing some fire over there, Noah. Thank you again for joining us. And last and certainly not least, we've got the American one. Jack, as always, thanks for hosting. Keystone Cops, thanks for dropping by and showing us grow and uh, uh, giving us the uh, the praise that you did. It's always good to hear from uh, people saying they benefit from the show and stuff. It's awesome. And thanks, everyone in chat, for hanging out with us tonight. I'm the American one. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. That is absolutely true. We'll be back next week. I'm your host, Jack Greenstock. Most weeks I can make it. Um, I'm Jack Greenstock on Instagram. Jack underscore Greenstock is my backup account. That's where I follow people, but I don't post anything on there. So if you DM me there, it doesn't give me notifications for some reason. So if I don't get back to you right away on Jack underscore Greenstock, that's the reason. This one right here, like you see, Jack Greenstock is my main account that I'll answer to you. Uh, my Jack underscore Greenstock on Twitter is my only Twitter account. And then I do the can of buzz at Jack Greenstock. Uh, very, very rarely post there, but again, I use it. I try to support the cannabis friendly social media accounts, uh, programs out there, apps, I guess. And, uh, last and certainly not least, if you don't have social media, you can email me jackgreenstock 47 at gmail.com. And if you want a copy of my book, 50 strains of green, we've got 50 strains.com. So 50 strains, S T R A I N S. Well, pretty stunned spelling on the spot it's a struggle right now but with that said girl love everybody thank you so much for joining us this week i look forward to seeing you all next week where we'll have uh, some topics to talk about cannabis related <laughs> anyway have fun everybody peace and love grower love everyone